Uncertainty is both the constant adversary and companion of those who till the land to feed us all. Last spring, that took the form of a pandemic that upended everything from labor supply to mismatches in supply and demand for agricultural products. With us now on how that's all unfolded over the year, and as is our custom, we'll introduce our guests from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in Halifax, Nova Scotia, with Sylvain Charlebois, Scientific Director of the Agri-Food Analytics Lab at Dalhousie University. In the village of Annan, just outside Owen Sound, Ontario, Rob Lipset, President of Beef Farmers of Ontario and a beef farmer himself. In Alora, Ontario, Mike Von Massau, food economist at the University of Guelph. And on her farm in the Holland Marsh in York Region, there's Avia Eek, a carrot and onion farmer and municipal councillor as well in the township of King. And it's great to welcome all of you on to TVO tonight. I want to start, Avia, get us started here. When it comes to farming, how would you describe the events of the past 10 months and what they've done to you? To say that the challenges that our farming community faced would be an understatement. Um, whether it was coming down to, the big thing was labor and the uncertainty of whether we were going to have our labor in time for early spring planting. That was that was a big deal. So um, I know I only have 30 seconds. So I would say um, labor challenges and um, yeah, at the very beginning, because this was all new to all of us. Okay, we'll dive in deeper as we continue our conversation. Rob, what would you add to that? Uh, I would suggest that we felt a lot of uncertainty and a lot of volatility in our market. And uh, as proactively as we tried to approach this when the pandemic was announced in March, it just seemed we were faced with one obstacle after the other and, and a lot of supply chain issues, both on our end and in our input end. Mike, over to you. I, I think I'd echo what, what the people uh, have already said. Just like the rest of us, farmers are people too, just like the rest of us, there was a, there was a certain amount of variability in the impact uh, that, that was felt on the farm, depending on specifically what you were producing. And Sylvain? Well, generally, uh, beyond labor, uh, I think uh, labor the labor issues were heavily uh, publicized. Uh, the one thing that, that stood up to me is, is processing. The processing sector across the country was not ready for COVID, and farmers paid for it. Uh, there were huge disruptions, whether it's in livestock or in horticulture, uh, it was very difficult for our farmers to cope with the, with the shocks coming from processing. Mike, let's follow up on the issue of food security, because when this pandemic started, I guess a lot of people had some reasonable questions about whether or not the food chain, the food supply, processing, the whole nine yards, whether it could keep up and whether our supermarket shelves would continue to be stocked. What have you noticed over the past 10 months on that front? Well, I think what we learned was that, that our food system is incredibly robust and resilient, notwithstanding some of the issues that, that Sylvain raised with the processing sector and that Evia raised relative to labor. We saw some disruption. Uh, we saw significant pain, I think, at the, at the producer level when those beef processing plants closed. Uh, th those were an issue particularly for producers, much less for consumers because we have this integrated supply chain. So in terms of food availability, we did really well. I think what that does though, is masks the significant food security impact that COVID has had, not in terms of availability, but in terms of all of the people who've lost work, who've seen income go down and became food insecure because they couldn't afford food and not because they couldn't find food. Right. Let's let's uh, carry on on that regard, because Sylvain, you led a team that basically looked at the pricing situation you have over a number of years. You got the 2021 edition of Canada's food price report just out, and we want to take a look at some of what you are forecasting for the coming year. Canadians, you say, can expect to see an overall food price increase of three to five percent for the year 2021. The most significant increases are predicted for both meat and vegetables, and that gets you up 45 to 6.5% over last year. The annual food expenditure is estimated to be almost $700 higher, that's 5% higher, this year for, let's say, the average family of four, and that is the highest forecasted increase since the start of this report more than a decade ago. So, Van, just get us behind those numbers a little bit. How did you come to them? 
Well, I mean, we, we do work with three other universities for this report, including Guelph, uh, the University of Saskatchewan, and UBC in Vancouver. And we run different models, and uh, our models were telling us uh, a very, very dim story for this year for bakery, meat, and, and, and vegetables, unfortunately. Now, for Ontario specifically, uh, the forecast is more around 3%, but keep in mind, Steve, that the general inflation rate is very low. So 3% uh, will, will, be, will appear to be very high for people with tight budgets. I mean, food affordability is an issue across the country, including Ontario, unfortunately. Could be twice the inflation rate, in other words. If you look at the last 20 years, and it's in our report this year, if you look at the last 20 years, the uh, food price index has outpaced the general price index across the country and in Ontario specifically uh, the food uh, uh, the food index actually has outpaced the general inflation rate by 20 points it, which means really that Ontarians are spending more money relative to their income right now compared to 20 years ago and one more fast follow-up with you Sylvain how often are you wrong on these prognostications yeah, so over the last decade, so we started back in 2010, our accuracy rate is 85%. So we've been wrong, but not a whole lot. Gotcha. Okay. Avia, why don't you come in here and tell us, in the course of doing what you do, have you had to charge more for your products? Okay, so um, to put it all into context for your viewers, um, yeah, the, the, the price of food has gone up. I know I did an interview earlier this earlier last year with CTV and they were asking about food shortages. And I said, well, it's really too early to tell. And it's too early to tell if the cost of food is going to be going up because it's all based on supply and demand. So in a normal non-COVID year, um, we have international trading partners. So if there's some kind of a weather issue here in Ontario or anywhere in Canada that's going to disrupt our fruit and vegetables, we have trading partners that we can generally count on to provide our residents with that food. In a year like 2020 with the pandemic, and it wasn't just Canada being impacted by this virus, it was all of our trading partners. So labor was an issue worldwide, not just here in Canada. As a result of that, there are some crops that some farmers worldwide throughout Canada, throughout Ontario, chose, it's like, nope, that's too labor intensive. We don't have the labor force that we normally would have. We're going to switch crops or we're going to switch and, and we're, or we're not going to plant some acreage. So not all of the acreages got planted in the traditional ways that they would have been planted. So um, you have to look at it contextually. Um, number one, yields were down. We had a polar vortex go through right in spring. Then we had a heat wave. We didn't have our labor um, to help us with irrigating. Irrigating is a big deal. It's not just, you could do it alone, but it's very <laughs> labor intensive. Um, so you've got all these, all these things coming against you. So, um, yeah, if we got a rain, yeah, the crops could come back. Um, some of them did. We had, we held, had yield shortages. So when it comes to food, the cost of food going up, if there's a demand for that food and there is, if we lost the processing sector, I know, and on our farm, we grow carrots and onions. And on our farm, we generally grow, you know, anywhere from five to 10 acres of jumbo carrots for the processing market. We lost money because that processing market was no longer available. And once you've got your seed, it's not like you can say, oh, well, you know what? We've got the jumbos, but we're not going to plant them. We planted them. We took a loss. That's the way the business goes. Okay. So um, to put it all into context, there's, there's not as much not the same crops being grown and we can't count on our international partners. So yeah, the, the, the cost is gone up. I, I totally appreciate that context. Rob, I wonder if you'd follow up on that by, by talking to us about what the cost of added COVID protocols might be on the typical farm and what that adds to the cost. Yeah, I guess for beef, we're in a unique position where we're more price takers than price setters. So all these additional costs have just driven up our cost of production on the farm level. And so it's been a real combat for us that uh, a lot of volatility and uncertainty where we have a product ready to go to market and uh, we don't have the processing space available. So essentially we are working through a zero income uh, depending on loans and financing as much as possible uh, to make it through to when we can uh, actually get, say, a paycheck. 
I don't want to get too personal with you, but since you brought it up, are, are you, what's your financial situation right now? You're breaking even, you're making any money, you're losing money, where are you at? Uh, in the beef industry, we've traditionally been a low profit margin uh, industry. So uh, break even in some sectors of the industry is good. We're broken down into uh, cow calf producers, backgrounders, and then the feedlot operations that do the uh, final finishing of the beef product. So uh, through the various sectors, it's a little different. Uh, the cow-calf operators, uh, which I am, have struggled a little bit just due to the trickle-down effect of our industry where uh, cattle at the end of the line aren't moving, uh, which reduces the amount of sales that occur at my end. So uh, personally, I'd say break-even is a positive outlook for the 2020 year, and, and it looks like we may hit that break-even level. And what about the cost of delays? How do you figure that in? Uh, it, it's one of those things in our industry that you can't put a price on. I know uh, a lot of people have talked to me about uh, the supply chain for our parts and our feed inventory and and just the lack of availability of parts to keep your tractor running or feed to feed your animals and delays in getting it there. And you really can't put a price on that, except for at the feedlot level where if you have an animal that's ready to go and you're forced to hold on to it for an extra period of time, the average cost of that is $4 per head per day. Hmm. So uh, after a month's time, you've got $120 extra added expense to that animal. And when you work on an average of a uh, profit of $55 per head, there's going to be a lot of people struggling to make it through this. Right. Mike, pick up the story, if you would. Consumers, what might they be noticing that's different uh, well, with the shopping experience? Well, I think Sylvain highlighted that, that we've seen some price increases. We expect to see more in price increases. We saw some specific COVID-related price increases. And one of the ironies is, while the beef producers were seeing decreased returns, when some of those plants were closed uh, in June, we saw some higher than normal price increases for beef in the summer. So we're, we're seeing kind of the irony of consumers having to pay a bit more at, while producers were getting paid a little less. But the other thing that I think we've seen throughout uh, COVID is a reduction in choice that uh, as demand went up at retail, which it did, restaurants closed to a significant degree and have been slow to come back, uh, companies uh, withdrew some of those uh, slower moving or lower volume the stock keeping unit skews and so we saw and continue to see a little bit less choice on the supermarket shelves so where we think we might be short some things we're not really short we're just seeing fewer options and, and a perfect example uh, I, I've become one of those COVID bakers and uh, you can't get uh, multi-grain flour because it was a slower mover and, and the companies have focused on those high volume products. Hmm. When you say you're a COVID baker, are, do you mean professionally or just for fun at home? Just for fun at home. I'm one of those people who started to bake bread. Uh, uh, and uh, at our house, we haven't bought bread since the, since the middle of April, uh, just because we're stuck at home. It's a nice, it's a nice diversion from sitting in front of a camera and talking to students. Hmm. You getting good at it? Baking the bread, I, I mean? I, 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 I don't mean to brag, but I think I'm getting pretty good at it. So I've got a couple of really good recipes. <laughs> good for and you. Good local flour here in Fergus. Too. Amen to that. Amen to that. Sylvain, uh, when prices go up, and you're forecasting that they will above the rate of inflation, maybe significantly above the rate of inflation for those of us in Ontario, what do consumers do typically? Well, so, so yeah, there, there's nothing wa wrong with food inflation. It's, it's when food inflation exceeds the general inflation rate, it, it, it becomes a problem. I would say, really, in in grocery stores, you should expect, as Mike said, there, there are going to be fewer choices. Uh, uh, right now, most grocers are revisiting their portfolio of brands. Uh, you should expect more private labels because people are going to be trading down. Uh, private labels tend to be cheaper. And, and what I mean by private labels... President's Choice, Compliments, No Name, those are the brands that you probably will likely see more often now. The other thing, Steve, that we have to remind ourselves is that the supply chain is, is becoming way more open. Everyone wants to do business online now. Everyone is selling to the consumer directly, even farmers, 5% 
of all sales right now conducted online when it comes to food, it's food sold by farmers or farmers markets right now in the country. Does any of that violate any marketing board um, treaties that are in place? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Uh, no, they're, well, they're being very careful, obviously, within province, within your own province, you can sell uh, freely, no problem. When it comes to alcohol, dairy, other things, other issues come up. But uh, right now, people are being very careful. Gotcha. Rob, yeah. how about uh, Ontario beef in Japan? I know our wares are very popular in Japan. Uh, did that help at all during the course of the pandemic? Uh, for Ontario beef, the Japan market really has carried us through the pandemic. Uh, we've made some really good inroads in the last two years in Japan. Uh, we lost the re the restaurant business as we did here in Ontario through the pandemic, but the retail really picked up and, and Japan never really backed off the amount of Ontario beef they had imported. So where we lost some other markets, uh, the uptick in sourcing local Ontario grown beef and uh, the export to Japan has really floated us through this. So uh, we're looking forward to getting through the pandemic and seeing if we can't increase that Japan market even more. So just so I understand the significance of it, w would you say it kind of saved your year, the fact that Japan was there? Uh, I, I think it will have saved our year and probably the biggest point of that is there are more retail outlets in Japan selling Ontario beef brands than there are in the province of Ontario right now. So we have a little more work to do here at home to ramp up our local product, but uh, Japan certainly has been a savior for us. Okay, let's have some discussion here about one of the issues that gets uh, quite a great deal of attention in the news media, and that is the issue of migrant workers and the challenges that that presents. And Avia, I'm gonna bring you in to start with because, uh, well, give us a sense of how it plays out on your farm, the whole issue of migrant workers. Okay, we've been into, um, we've been part of the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program since 1998. We tried for five years prior to that to hire locally and with dismal results. I mean, sometimes people would show up, sometimes they wouldn't, or they could only work a few hours. It was too hot, blah, blah, blah. So um, in 1998, we started with the program. It's been very successful. Um, it's kind of like a foreign aid program. These people can't get jobs in their own countries. They come up here and they help provide our Canadians with cheap food because um, we have a contract. Canada has a contract with the source countries um, and and those those contracts are adhered to. So back to, well, we'll push it forward now to 2020. We normally, we do our labor market impact assessment. We put our ads out advertising for Canadian workers. That has to be done as part of the Lima process. And um, it's a 13 page application. It has to be done every year. And um, as, if, as if circumstances are gonna change. But anyway, um, I call it an exercise in futility, but that's me. <laughs> and um, so, you know, as an example, in 2019, I didn't get any responses from any Canadians asking for a job in 2020 when I advertised. So my application went through and that was fine. I had asked that our workers come, we get three workers from Trinidad and one gentleman has been with us 10 years, um, 11 years. And the other gentleman's been with us six years. It was a one, it was the first year for one of the new workers. And so we request them to come up the end of April so we can do our onion transplanting. We purchase thousands of dollars of, of seed. We send it down to Keller Brothers in Beamsville. They grow it in their greenhouses. The seedlings get shipped up to us. Um, we did 12 acres of um, we did 12 acres of yellow cooking onions and red onions. So, and the reason why you want to do an early market is because there's that window between the fresh in America and the, the U.S., which is our main trading partner, and and Canada. So there's a little window, two to three week window, where you have an opportunity to make some extra money because it's fresh market. Gotcha, um, Avia. How many? How many? Um, I think you call them seasonal agricultural workers. Some people call them migrant workers. Whatever. How how many do yeah. you have in total there? We have three. Um, so back to your question, because I know I tend to ramble. Um, I'm passionate about this. And so they were supposed to come up April 29 and Trinidad was not letting people out of their country. Canada had lifted the exemption for travel to allow the workers to come up from other countries. And we didn't get our first guy till July 6th. So, um, and then the other two, we didn't get till mid August. We were forced to, we had to transplant and there's, um, my husband and I can't do it ourselves. 
it's been six years since I sat on a transplanter. So we went through this agency. We got local people because there was that hue and cry, hire local people that are on employment insurance. And I guess some people have this notion that um, agriculture is mindless. There's no skill involved. While the SOP program, Seasonal Agriculture Workers Program, is a low-skilled program, there is a level of skill required. And you can't just pull somebody off the street who's on EI and say, hey, come and work on my farm. There's a level, there's training that has to take place. And when the people are being switched out every two to three days over a two week period, um, it gets really tiring. Um, and and you're, you're constantly having to re retrain people every other day. And they well, just don't have the investment. Let me see if I can give people a sense. I appreciate that look at your farm in particular, but I want to give people a sense of the way it looks all across the province. According to Public Health Ontario, there were COVID outbreaks at 30 of the province's farms between April and mid-October, which, of course, as you just indicated, is when seasonal workers started to go home. Can I just check, have you had any outbreaks on your farm, Avia? No, um, we only have three. Okay, so again, I'm going to give some context here because um, when when COVID first became a thing, we set up an account with Gordon Food Service. I was not going to let my three workers off the farm. Like we have five different locations, um, but I was not going to let them go into town to go shopping. And I wanted to keep our bubble, our bubble. And then we were told, no, you can't do that. So imagine it's hard to contain three people imagine some of these farmers these larger farmers in southwestern ontario where there were you know 50 plus workers well that's How it let me pick up on that because that's that yeah. you, you've put your finger on a big question here because of course during that same period spring to fall more than 1300 migrant workers apparently tested positive for covid and that's about five percent of ontario's farm worker population that's 10 times what the regular positivity rate is during the same period I got a little quote here from somebody. This is from the CBC's Fifth Estate. They spoke to one migrant worker who came to Southern Ontario from Jamaica, and here's how he described his experience on this farm that grows fruits and vegetables. He said, honestly, I f it feels like I'm in a prison. We're allowed to go out two to three hours every two weeks, only on our shopping days to get our food. That's the only time we can leave. If we leave and the owner sees us leaving, anything like that, then the first thing he would want is to send us home. And this worker was expected to work up to 17 hours a day, six or seven days a week. Okay, how does that compare with your situation, Avia? Our workers work 10 hours a day, but I understand I understand where the workers coming from because they feel their, their freedoms are being taken away. Let's face it, through this pandemic, all our freedoms have been taken away. Um, when it comes to a farm operation, my husband and I are working with our workers. If they go off and do something, if they don't take it quite as seriously, as as we take it they come back and infect us my husband gets sick and dies there's our farm gone hmm. so it's not just it, it, it's these are very different um there's extenuating circumstances in a normal year non-pandemic year these guys can come and go as they please they have all the freedoms in the world um their off time is their off time um there's a contract that yeah they have to work so many hours they're here to work if if on our farm our guys work 10 hours a day if they choose and they get sundays off if they choose to work on a sunday because they want the money we're not going to say no to them but we have we are very we we constantly when they came up i gave them a booklet i had we had a conversation with them making them understand the the dire the dire consequences what can happen if they don't listen and take this seriously. No, I totally um, appreciate we, that. Let me figure it, let me yep. uh, move it over to Rob here. Give us um, give us the 411 on how it works in the beef industry. Uh, sure. For the most part, uh, Ontario's beef farms are family run operations and very few operations uh, access migrant workers for on-farm work. But where migrant workers are important to our industry is that's what fills most of our processing facilities with labor. So we've seen uh, prior to the pandemic, we saw quite a few of our processing plants uh, close down and uh, they cited that labor challenges and access to workforce were one of the biggest problems. And we've just seen that amplify with the COVID-19 issue that when plants closed, we didn't have any extra workers to bring in to pick up that slack. And that's where it's affected us on the farmer level. How about on your farm? Do you have any migrant workers there? Uh, no, just uh, myself, my father, and my brother-in-law run our smaller size family operation. You guys all getting along okay these days? Uh, we tend to get along pretty well. We understand that 
when you're this close, both uh, working relationship and blood relationship, that you just have to be careful what you say and how you conduct yourself. <laughs> that may go for every business these days and every family these <laughs> days as well. Uh, Sylvain, come on in and tell us, um, in your view, do you think Canada's uh, food distribution, food processing, agricultural system is too dependent on migrant workers? What do you think? Uh, I would say this, uh, we look at the entire country and something happened on Ontario that was uh, quite unusual. I, I personally think that farmers were unfairly targeted uh, with uh, with the situation with migrant workers. Uh, farmers were doing their best to protect them. And as Avia said, uh, uh, most of our freedoms were taken away with COVID. It's not because of what was going on on farms. And there's a huge misunderstanding of what farming is all about. Uh, farming, I worked on farms when I was a kid. It's a lot of work. It's, it's tough work. And uh, it's not easy. And so I think there's a case to be made for for migrant workers in our ag economy and uh and with COVID, it made it obvious that a lot of people just misunderstand their role specifically on farms mike what would you add to that well i i think there's there's something that that we need to recognize and i'm not blaming anyone in the food system but one of the costs of relatively cheap food canada notwithstanding some of the price increases that sylvan is talking about which are real and are outpacing the rate of inflation, the, the truth is that uh, the cost of cheap food is relatively low wages throughout the food system. Whether you're working in a kitchen at a restaurant, whether you're working uh, stocking shelves in a grocery store, or whether you're working in a beef processing plant, we're not paying people very much. Uh, and and so uh, it, it it's not anybody's fault. I'm not trying to put it, push it, pull, point any fingers here. But the truth is that because we have cheap food, we can't afford to pay people throughout the system. And I think that that's something we need to we, we need to take a, a long and hard look at because we've highlighted the 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 challenges with resilience uh, when problems occur. How would you see that happening, I, I, Mike? How would I see that happening? I yeah. think I think what 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 we need to do is come up with ways to reflect the actual value that we are producing. And that might mean continuing to have higher prices for food in order that we can pay people in restaurants a living wage, in order that we can pay people in grocery stores a living wage, in order that we can, and, and, and it's not, oh, let's point fingers at the beef farmers or let's point fingers at the beef processors. The market is, is establishing what those, those margins are. And I think we need to face the fact that that we're probably not paying enough for food. Sylvain, you wanted to add? My, my, yeah, migrant workers aren't necessarily cheap, by the way. <laughs> they're, they're paid well. The irony of it all is that we've seen more innovation at Farmgate in the last 30 years than in food retail. And in retail, of course, a lot of people are underpaid, which is really the big problem. CEOs are making... Uh, are getting huge bonuses, and most workers in grocery stores are earning a very low wage. That's that's the problem that uh, that I think that Mike is pointing to, and that needs to be resolved. And yes, uh, food affordability is going to become an issue, but at some point, we're going to think about what kind of food system we need to provide good quality food to people uh, so they can eat. But at the same time, how can people make a good living and make the food industry more attractive from farm to fork? Well, Sylvain, let me just do a quick follow with you. The, uh, I mean, we have a minimum wage in the province of Ontario. I think it's 14 and a quarter an hour. I is there an exemption for migrant workers to that, or do they have to get minimum wage? Uh, minimum on farm? Wage. Yeah. Well, actually, my, my guess that, that the minimum wage would apply, but they earn way more. In Nova Scotia here, the average salary in horticulture is about 18 to $19 an hour. Hmm. Avia, I say you nodding your head there. You pay minimum. You pay minimum wage. Actually, it just went up January first, so it's fourteen thirty nine. But add into that the cost of housing. We provide housing free. Our gen, our workers live in a 
three bedroom house. They each have their own bedroom. It's a beautiful little house. Um, so there's the cost of the housing, the utilities we pay for. Um, all they pay for is their food. So if you factor in, and then the fact that we pay part of their flight up here and part of their flight home, if you were to factor all that in, yeah, we could probably afford to pay somebody like maybe 18 or $19 an hour. But again, who wants to work 10 hours a day from, from the cold spring to the cold fall till mid-November um, for even that kind of money. People right. do not want to do that. They don't want to do those jobs. So, yeah. Um, when you say people, yeah, you we, mean people born in Ontario. Okay. Yep. Let's, uh, I got a few minutes left here, so let me touch on one more thing here. Uh, the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, they do surveys throughout the pandemic. Last one came out in October, 700 responses almost, and here were their top concerns. 60%, not surprisingly, worried about a global recession. 55% concerned about the financial impact on their farm. 52% citing trade and supply chain issues. Those were the top three. But when asked about mental health, this was interesting, 59%, almost 6 in 10, mentioned feeling more stress due to COVID-19. Uh, Rob, do those numbers resonate with you? Yeah, I wouldn't say I was surprised by any of the numbers that were uh, put up there. The, the volatility and the uncertainty is certainly weighing on primary producers. Uh, the beef farmers of Ontario... Uh, just before the pandemic hit, we started with some mental wealth, mental health well-being uh, seminars and encouraging our members to reach out. And we really ramped that up through the pandemic as we noticed uh, people were starting to feel stressors that they had never felt before. And recognizing that farmers consider themselves strong and resilient, were maybe a little reluctant to reach out for help. And uh, right now, I'd say one of our major concerns is the mental health well-being of our membership. So uh, although that number came in uh, right around all the rest, I, I'd put more emphasis on encouraging farmers to swallow their pride, for lack of better terms, and, and reach out should they feel something strange within themselves or if they notice it within a friend or a neighbor or family member. Just acknowledge that and, and offer some help. Uh, we have a lot of resources available through our organization and all the agriculture organizations. And there's even the agriculture uh, mental health helpline that can be called hmm. for uh, discreet conversation and, and venting. So I, I'd encourage everyone to reach out should they feel the need. Gotcha. Avia, what do you think needs to happen to get things back to quote unquote normal for this farming season well you know what and i guess i have a different i have a different view of of the whole thing um uh, other than the labor issue we're still like we sold all our crop it was still our our crop was still in the barn um, my husband was still selling carrots and onions when covid broke out so we we still moved our product we got paid very well where we went through the the labor was the issue um stress was caused because we didn't have labor when we needed it we didn't have reliable help even when we went through agencies um weeds you know weeds grew um we had yield reductions we had weather against us um but at the end of the day we harvested our crop and it's in the barn and we've been getting paid very well we've seen prices that we don't normally see and and this is a terrible thing to say but i've always said i've been married to bill for 32 years he's he's third generation farmer um we make money when there's um catastrophe with one of our trading partners unfortunately the pandemic has created um a level of catastrophe not a level that would be an understatement um but it has created a catastrophe so um because food supplies are down the cost is going up um, so from our perspective, it's business as usual for us and our workers, Trinidad wasn't letting them home, go home in the fall. So our guys are still here. So worrying hmm. about spring planting, we're going to be right on schedule this year. I bet you though, my, my, yeah, mother nature's always on schedule her own. Uh, but I bet you everybody's going to be a lot happier once, um, well, you know what goes into the arm. I want to thank Sylvain Charlebois yes. from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Rob Lipset from Annan, Ontario, Mike Van Massau from the University of Guelph, he's in Alora, Avia Eek, the carrot and onion farmer in the Holland Marsh. It's great to have all of you on TVO tonight. Hang in there, everybody. Thank you again, Steve, for the opportunity. Thank Thanks, Steve. Take have care, a great day. Thank you so much. Stay well. Steve. 
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.